So, one of the key takeaways here that I want you guys to uh, get from this, we've talked about that denial stage, right? That denial stage, we want to move from that. So, what we want to move to from that denial stage is going to be the deliberation. You guys see the arrows here as far as what am I going to do? All right, as far as this social proof, one of the takeaways that you're going to be able to see here is that in the video, when nobody did anything, if, if one person didn't do anything, nobody did. But as soon as one person stepped up and decided to do something, and everybody started doing something. So think about that when we're talking about denial, uh, our denial stage. Am I hearing gunfire? Is that gunfire? And then he said, oh. So now we're both in that denial stage together. So now we turned about three or four of the people. That's not like gunfire or something like that. We're all, we're all stuck in it together. But if, I'm, if he's like, hey, is that gunfire? Yeah, that's gunfire. That's gunfire. I'm going. He's probably going to you know, that is going to fight versus staying in that denial stage, all right? Again, so we want to get out of that, all right? And, is, and make sure that we, I want to make sure that I do the right thing. I have a plan because if someone sees me enacting my plan, then they're going to follow. That's just, that's just, that's just how, that's just the reality of the situation. If one person does something, if one person acts, everybody's going to act. If nobody acts at all, if one person doesn't act, nobody's going to act. That's the social proof. So when we're talking about doing what we need to do to save our lives, we want to get up, we want to get into action, jump into action, get out of that denial stage, all right, versus getting stuck in it. Because if I'm stuck in it and I turn to the other person, I turn to two other three or four people, all right, hopefully they can be able to get out of this so that they can get, so I can get out of it as well. Okay? Everybody follow me? Is that fair? Okay. So with our deliberation, we'll talk about a little bit of stress response. Uh, like, again, like I said, our heart rate tends to climb up. It's just like that car accident that, that, that you had. Either you got worried or you were with somebody, and then the air bought the bags All right, your heart rate started to go up. The more your heart rate goes up, all right, a lot of things start to diminish. All right? and, so, and we call that uh, tunnel vision. So you may not notice uh, certain things, but what color, especially if the car takes off, what color is the car? Uh, I think it was black when it was actually blue. Well, I think it was red, but it was actually yellow. Okay, so when our heart rate starts to go up or whatever, and stuff like that, as police officers, we train our police officers to be able to operate, to be able to think, to be able to operate, be able to know what force option is reasonable and necessary, especially in today's climate, even though there's stress levels to it. All right, it's not an easy job when you're a police officer, and you're getting on scene, and you see a couple people fighting, and you see an all pandemonium, and, and everything's breaking loose. I have minimal seconds to be able to figure out who's the threat, what the threat is, and then also be able to figure out what force option on my belt is the best option that's reasonable and necessary uh, to be able to handle that situation. I only have seconds to do that, especially when my stress level is through the roof. Okay, so we want to try and train ourselves to be able to still be able to think effectively, make decisions, talk effectively when our heart rate is up and when our stress level. So, with a little, little bit more about deliberation, you have the human brain, and then you also have the lizard brain. So what we want to talk about here, as far as the human brain and the lizard brain, is there's going to be two type of resp responses that, uh, our body, that our body will do when the stress level is through the roof. Okay? And with that, so with our, our human brain, that's the rational side of our brain. We take our time. We think about our thoughts. We take our time to figure out what we're going to do, what type of decision we want to make, because we have that time. Our body's calm. We have that time. There's, there's no stress or anything like that. Then you also have the lizard side of your brain that's very, very reactive. All right? It's very, very reactive. It jumps. It has a plan. It's either going to freeze. It's either going to take off. Just think about certain animals. When you're walking down the trail and you see a deer, and then he pops up his head, and then he just takes off. All right, that's that lizard part of the brain that, hey, there's a threat somewhere, I need, I, need, I need to bust a move. All right, versus the human side of our brain, where we're kind of calm, we're collective. So again, in an unfortunate situation, we want to get out of that denial stage, all right, and we want the lizard side of our brain to be able to kick in as far as our decisive, uh, our, our deliberation, as far as what that plan is going to be, okay? And with the lizard brain, you're going to do one of three things. You're either going to fight, flight, or freeze. All right? We don't want to freeze. 
We don't want to take, we'll take off. We either want to fight or we want to flight. We want to leave as soon as we possibly can. Okay? Now, in deliberation, some other things to talk about as far as what is my plan going to be. Okay? When you start coming into this sanctuary now, I want you guys to start thinking. God forbid that the unthinkable happens in this sanctuary or on this property. What will I do? Whether it's church, whether it's the mall, whether it's the grocery store, whether it's to pick the kids up at daycare, whether it's when you go to work, you want to start considering your environment. If I needed to get out of this sanctuary as quickly as I possibly can, how would I be able to get out of here? You either use the front door that I came in. What if we couldn't use the front door? Use an exit here. What if this exit wasn't here? How, and we could not get out the front door. How could we be able to get out of the sanctuary? Windows, exactly. So again, you want to start thinking when you go into a microstuff. Think about your escape plan. Put a plan there. And then just ask yourself that simple question. What would I do if the unthinkable happened while I'm here right now? You go into a God, go and see Kirk Franklin at Phillips Arena. What would I do if the unthinkable happened right now before he gets on stage? How would I get out of here? What would I do? It's unfortunate that we have to consider those things, but this is the day and age of the reality that we live in. What would I do if in an hour from now when you're sitting at home about to eat Sunday dinner, the unthinkable happens if someone kicks in the front door? What would I do? You've got to have a plan. You gotta have a plan, you gotta think about it, you gotta practice it, because when it's time to actually act it out, you'll be able to do it without even thinking about it. That's what we call it muscle. And we're gonna talk about that here a little bit more. This diagram here, there was a fire that happened at a nightclub a couple years ago. Anybody remember that big fire that happened when it was on the news? And they had those pyrotechnics behind the stage and it erupted into a big fire and things of that nature, and then it killed a whole bunch of people. So this is the diagram from that nightclub, okay? Again, we're going back to that deliberation as far as what would I do and being aware of your environment. So what we have here is that diagram. This is the main entrance right here. This club was built to shuffle in the masses. Okay? It was not necessarily built for an emergency exit to shuffle the masses out of and out of this establishment. It was just built. Think about it. It's a club. It makes sense. We want to get as many people in here as much as, as we possibly can. But they fell short as far as if an emergency happens, how are we going to get people out as quickly as possible? Okay, so you have this entrance here. When you start thinking about how could they get out, you've got a small door back here where the stage was. You have a door back here by the kitchen and a door back here by the, by the bar. Okay, so the average patron that comes into this establishment, they're not thinking about this door, they're not thinking about that door by the kitchen, and they're not thinking about the main bar door. How are they thinking they're going to get out? Through here. If they can't get out here, what else can they do? Windows. Okay. Again, you want to think outside the box. Okay. As far as that. Next video we're going to watch is going to be the actual video footage from inside that nightclub when the fire erupted. Okay. And you'll be able to see a couple things. You'll be able to see some people stuck in that denial state we've been talking about, where it takes them a minute to be able to process. Is that the fire alarm? Is that the fire on stage? Absolutely, and then they start moving. Then you see the masses start moving, okay? So you'll be able to see some things unfold. As tragic as it is, you'll be able to see some of the points that we're talking about. Why we want to have a plan, why we want to get out of that now stage, okay? We want to be aware of our surroundings if an unfortunate situation happens while we're there, okay? All right, let's watch this video.
standing there, look at him. He was still in denial. He's like, are they stop? First step in lending a helping hand. Okay? Now, this diagram is from the crime scene uh, investigation, the arson investigation. This is a diagram of the arson investigation uh, sketch from inside the club. These circles here indicate how many bodies were found in that area of the club. Okay, so again, remember, this is the front entrance for the last diagram. This is the stage over here. There was a door here, kitchen, and the bar. So you had three people by the bar. You found nine bodies here, ten bodies back here in the back office space. Two, one, two, another one, another two. There was nine bodies here right in front of the stage. Eighteen people here in this pool hall. Remember when we talked about, hey, how would you be able to get out? And everybody said the windows. Those windows were right here. Again, because they weren't necessarily aware of their surroundings. Okay, everybody saw there was a little bit of a delay before people started moving. That's a fire on stage. And everybody just sitting there just looking at it like, what happened to the music? Now, granted, you're going to take some other things into consideration as far as alcohol in people's system, all right, how they'll be able to process things again. But when you go into these environments, when you go anywhere, I don't leave the house without thinking. If the unthinkable happens, what will I do? How am I going to get out of here if something bad happens? Okay. So again, this just drives home the point as far as that deliberation. What is my plan going to be? Okay. All right, so again, in that deliberation, you want to calm yourself, combat breathing, shift your emotions. What we mean here by shifting your emotions is, in situations like this, what are you always going to fear? Uh, feel? Fear. Going to be scared. Going to be terrified. That's a, that, that's a natural response, but I want to shift that emotion to something else. Maybe like anger, okay? Because we know when we get angry, just wait until I, just wait till I get over there. When we get angry, we're going to do what we said we're going to do. So I want to shift that emotion, okay? Are you going to be scared? Absolutely. Is it going to, are you, is it going to feel fear? Absolutely. But with that fear, we do things. The body starts to succumb to that fear and break down, freeze, all right, get stressed out. So we want to shift that emotion to something else, like fear, like, hey, I need to get mad that the thing was happening right now where I'm at. And I need to shift that emotion so that I can do something to save my life and someone else's. Okay? Stay fit. All right, mentally and physically, okay? Script, practice. This is extremely, extremely important. Some of the most successful athletes, some of the most uh, uh, successful business people out there, when you think about sports, they're only as good as they are because they practice it over and over and over and over and over to where it's just a muscle. And we do this every day, Saints. We do this every day. When you wake up in the morning, you hit the alarm clock, what do we do? It's news. Without even thinking about it. We have sleep. And then we finally wake up like, I'm going to be in the morning. That's because you hit the news without even thinking about it. When we get in the car, what do we do? You start the car, adjust the mirror, foot on the brake, and the hand on the kitchen. Without even thinking about it. Everybody tracking on that? Again, we do these things. Like, just think of all the countless things that we do every single day that you have such a muscle memory to because you've done it repetitively over and over and over again. So we're thinking about the emergency response. We're thinking about skills that I need to be able to save my life. I want to think about it over and over again. Think about how many times we do fire drills so we get out of the building as quick as we possibly can. I want to think about, hey, if somebody kicked in my front door right now, how long would it take me to get upstairs to the closet, to the shoebox, to be able to get my fire on? Have we practiced it? So that it's just, I mean, so you're just doing it, even though you're, you're scared and you're thinking like, man, I just can't get my front door, but you're cool. You're not wasting any time to get out of that denial state. Go straight to your plane. These are the things that we have to think about. It's extremely, extremely important. Okay? So script, practice it, talk about it. Talk about it here in the church. Talk about it in the most, in your little community group uh, uh, meetings. Talk about it, you know, in the family. Myself and the family, we have a plan anywhere we go. The missus and the little one, she knows that if there's something that pops off, as me as an off-duty police officer, if I decide that I'm going to make myself a part of that situation, other than just getting on the phone, they understand to get to the car, call 911, 
and give up on a line of scripture. That's a plan. We have a plan. Okay? We practice it. We talk about it all the time. Something goes wrong, this is what we do. Okay, it's extremely, extremely important. All right, Rick Rescorla. I'll talk about him real quick. This guy was, uh, he worked for one of those big companies inside the World Trade Center. Okay? And I'm just going to touch on him briefly, and then we'll just keep on moving so we can make it on time. He was hired uh, to um, practice and to be able to get the, the organization's emergency management skills as far as the fire drills and stuff like that. He was hired to be able to kind of keep them on their toes. So this guy, Rick, he would literally show up to work, and we're going to have a fire drill today. But he wouldn't tell anybody when they're going to do it. So his boss was kind of got a little, a little frustrated with him, the people in the company, because he would just do these fire drills at the just at the worst times. But he would be on you like, hey man, you need to come on, you need to get on this and fire drill. We need to act, we need to train as we're going to fight, act as if it's the real deal. Because he had that forward thinking, like, hey, if you don't think what happens in this World Trade Center. On these floors that our organization occupies, I want our people to be prepared. To be prepared. All that day at 9 11, when the towers hit, again, because they practiced it over and over again, because Rick was taking authority to decide about this evacuation drill over and over and over again, on that day, they were receiving uh, announcements for everybody to shelter in place after the first plane hit the towers. After the first plane hit the towers, they See that those announcements, everybody shelter in place, and then the second plane did. But Ricky said, no, we're not going to shelter in place. We're going to do our emergency evacuation. We're just like we've been and we've taught. We, we, we talk. We, we trade. I've talked. We trade over and over and over again. So he put that plane into place. All right? He is credited with making sure everybody in that organization was able to get out of the World Trade Center before they came to us. Before the towers came down, he was last seen going back in the tower because he wanted to do one more quick overload to make sure all of the people in the organization got out. And then the towers came down. But again, if it wasn't for his aggressiveness as far as having a plan, we practice it over and over and over again. That way, if and when it happens, we're prepared and ready to go. All right? He has been incredible for saving the lives of every person. I think at least 1,500 employees in that organization. They occupy like three or four floors on the World Trade Center. So again, it's extremely important. Have a plan, talk about it, all right? Create this, the discussion at work. Put the responsibility on your employers. Like, hey, what is our plan? If your desk is next to a door that's been broken for five to 10 years that you've been employed there, we need to have a discussion about it. You see what I'm saying? Because this stuff is important. We watch this stuff unfold on all the news and we sit there like, man, it's, it's just heartbreaking. But it can very, very well happen to any one of us or any one of us around. Right? Keep on moving, keep on moving. So again, now we're moving into our decisive moment, knowing what to do. So we'll talk about a couple active shooter events. Real quick, we'll talk about the definition of an active shooter event. Okay? All it is is attempted mass murder. It's a stranger walking into an environment like this, or walking into the CNN Center, or Phillips Arena, or over there at Lennox Mall, and just attempting to just shoot as many people, random strangers as possible. Attempted mass murder. That's what an active shooter event is. Okay? So the shooter, there's no profile. They have an evasion mindset. Some, they broadcast what they want to do. All right, so you never know who that person is. We want to make sure that we're paying attention to our surroundings, paying attention to the people, especially in our workplace, people at the church, you know, people at our schools, things of that nature. If you see something, say something. If it don't look right, say something. So we don't see right about that fellow over there in output at the grocery store. We need to say something. We just don't think about it to ourselves and not the fact, I was thinking something wrong right about that guy. Let's say something. Let's go ahead and speak up. It's okay for hurt people's feelings. They'll be all right. They'll be okay. They will be okay. I'm sure I've walked into plenty of places or whatever. People look at me like, and then they find out that I'm all that I'm on the up and up and I'm good. Everything's fine. Okay. You see something, something don't seem right. Say something. Again, that's that denial state. I'm looking at it. I don't. That's not right. 
But I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in that denial phase about it. No, we want to make sure that we get out of that denial stage. That don't look right, so we need to, I think mean, something needs to happen. Okay. All right, this next one is going to be uh, uh, a graph. This is going to, this is going to show. This is going to show, it's going to populate and show all of the active shooter uh, events that have occurred all over the U.S. since the year 2000. Now the smaller dots here is zero to four people were shot. The medium size, five to nine people were shot. The big dot, ten, ten or more people were shot. Okay. So since 2014, all right, is that you can see it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And what do we see more of? Good ones. Okay. So again, when we're talking about getting out of that denial stage, having a plan, I practice that plan, they'll think of what happens. I'm not playing, my mom's not playing tricks on me. I go to my decisive movement and I make something happen. All right, and then under that social proof, people see me. Beating feet, they're going to beat feet also. Okay, it, 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 everybody see how we're connecting the knots here? All right, it's extremely, extremely important. It's 179 since the year 2000. All right, location of the attacks: uh, 50 uh, more percent of them are in a campus area. Um, a little bit over 20 percent education. Over 10 percent happen outdoors, and then you have the others. Okay, so again, it can happen anywhere. It can happen anywhere. No place is in the Okay? It even happens on the military bases. I'm also in the military. I drove right over there and dropped their reserve base. It can happen on that base as well. Okay? So no place is immune to an active shooter event like this. If someone wants to get a, a, their hands on a weapon, they want to they wreak havoc on, havoc on that area, they will. And we need to have a plan for what we need to do to save our lives and somewhere else. Okay? The uh, shooter connection. It's usually, it's really right down the line. About 55% of the time, there is no connection. That, 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 uh, that shooter is going to be, uh, he's not going to know me from the campaign. And it's not going to matter. Sometimes there is a connection. There are a lot of instances and situations where there is a connection. Either a past employee or a family member or something like that or a bad breakup. But a lot of times, it's just a complete stranger. Okay? All right, Fort Hood, Texas. Everybody remembers that one that happened? All right, and they had just, uh, when this occurred, the military police on that installation had just received this active shooter response training at least a couple of weeks before it had happened. Okay. So that happened, uh, let's see here. We have Chattanooga, Tennessee. What happened right out again, like I said, no places to be. This is, these are all military installations. Right outside the, the recruitment office. Okay. So 2015. Everybody remembers where the, the, the term World Postal is? Yeah. Happened from? This one in, in uh, Edmond, Oklahoma. Again, some of these ones we don't hear about. Who would have thought that 179 active shooter events, and that's just from the FBI's reporting standards. I'm sure other organizations will, will report different stats and use different information to report different stats. But from the information we have, 179, damn yeah, it, I mean, the, the, the new. And I'll hear about all 179, but some of them you just never hear about. But this one, the guy was a, a previous postal worker, all right, and uh, he, he came in, shot, I, I believe he shot uh, a couple of employees. He had killed a couple of family members before he got to work. And that's where the term on postal uh, came from. That was back in 1986. All right, so now the number of deaths, all right, there are two things that determine the number of deaths in an active shooter situation. Okay, one of those things is going to be how quickly the police respond. And like I said, here in the city of Atlanta, the average response time is about three minutes. In the city of Atlanta, that response time is going to be cut in half. All right, you've got Georgia Tech Police, Georgia State University Police, you have the Federal uh, Reserve Police, Modern PD, Atlanta PD, you got Full County Police, Full County Sheriff. I'm already at seven and I can keep on going. Those as far as these jurisdictions in the downtown area alone that overlap each other and would all have received the same action response training. Okay, so officers will be uh, on scene relatively quickly. Okay. The second thing that determines the number of deaths 
is going to be target availability. Does everybody understand what I mean by target availability? If I make myself a target. So again, I'm in the grocery store. I'm hearing gunfire on the next aisle. I know that's gunfire. I'm not my mind. I'm not having that argument with myself. That's the wrong time to go back and forth with myself. That's the wrong. Charles, we're not going to do this today. That's gunfire. All right. So we did. I'm I'm moving. I'm not making myself a target. Target availability. We don't make ourselves a target for the bad guy. All right. He has nothing or anybody to shoot. Does that make sense? Is that fair? Again, so the two things that determine the number of deaths is going to be target availability and how fast the police respond. So again, we get that out now stage, we have our plan, we thought about it, we, we trade, we practice it over and over again, then I think what happened, we act it out, and we're gone. So that we're not a target. Versus remember it now in the Columbine, the teacher said, everybody under the table. Everybody under the table. They were sitting targets. Again now. Ms. Patty, she did her best. She did, she did her due diligence as a teacher on that day. She did what she, only thing she knew how to do. But again, as we get this more information is out. I want to have as much schools as I can in my toolbox so that at any given point in time, I might not need it now, but at some point in time, I can reach my toolbox and be able to use it. Three minutes, like I said, is the average response time. All right, so now we're getting into the, the meat and potatoes here, civilian response. Don't deny, you hear no fire, it's not fireworks, it's not firecrackers, it's not the 4th of July, that's gunfire. Don't let your mind play tricks on you. Get out of that denial, it's extremely, extremely important. The faster I can get out of that denial stage and move to my, my uh, deliberation and then my decisive moment, the better. Okay? All right, we're going to listen to uh, Ms. Christina Anderson. She was a student, everybody remembers the Virginia Tech active shooter, right? Where the general came in, he barricaded all the all the doors, chained all the doors shut uh, in the in the school building, and then walked up on the floor, started walking into all the classrooms, shooting a whole bunch of students and teachers. She was shot. She was one of the students shot uh, at that incident, and she goes around now and does a lot of public speaking, talking about her uh, her situation, about her experience. So we're going to talk about. We're going to listen to what she has to say real quick, and then we'll keep pressing forward. So this is pretty important. This day. I am sitting in exactly the same seat I always did, in the back right hand corner on the right side of the class. What we don't know is that at this time, someone is downstairs and he's chaining all of the doors shut. There's supposed to be desks there. Oh, you guys can see. We heard the first round of shots outside in the hallway, and my teacher, she opened the door. She immediately slammed it and she said, Call 911. And the second that door closed, he walks in. He walks in shooting. There's absolutely no time. He goes to the other side of the classroom by the windows. He's holding two guns. He doesn't say anything. He just starts going down the rows of people. It's very quick. It's very loud. It's very scary. We had these very shitty desks. I get on the floor. I put my knees under the chair. My stomach on the seat. Hands over head. Eyes are closed. As the shots keep going, and it's, like I said, very loud, I can tell it's getting closer and closer. And I'm telling myself, brace yourself, your turn's gonna come. Now, I didn't know what that meant. Like, I didn't think I was gonna get shot, but I knew that something really serious was going on. And I knew for whatever reason that I should just play dead. He shoots me, the first time's in the back. And you'd be surprised, getting shot doesn't hurt that much because shot overtakes you, but it starts to like burn and really kind of seep in, and that's when it gets really uncomfortable. Um, it's not pleasant. He leaves the first time, he goes press the hall, and while he's gone, cell phones are ringing, people are coughing, and the smell of gunpowder has like completely filled the room. Gunpowder is like this really sticky, pungent, warm smell, and it just makes you very, very thirsty. He comes back. Now, this time, the shooting is more intermittent. It's slower because he's looking to see who's alive. I remember telling myself to stop breathing because I can feel myself like hitting that chair and I'm saying, stop, like, he can see that you're alive. The third and final time, he killed himself in front of our classroom. When the police broke in, the first thing the guy said was, we have a lot of blacks in here. I didn't know what that meant, but when police do the crime scene, they have 30 seconds. If you're red, you're critically injured. If you're yellow, you'll live. Black means you're dead. 
in nine minutes, he killed 11 of my classmates and my teacher. 32 people lost their lives that day. All right. So again, if you think about some things she said, the teacher, uh, her mom's going on, she closed the door, she said, put someone call my mom. Now, uh, on that day, he frequented at least a couple different classrooms. Okay? Now, some teachers in other classrooms were a little bit more successful in trying to think outside the box and do something, do anything to be able to stop this guy from entering the classroom. And some people were more part again, because they just did not have these concepts and these principles. They just weren't aware of them. All right, again, but they did their due diligence on that day um, to just be able to try and get out of the situation the best they could. Um, certain teachers, there was a teacher that quickly locked the door and then he barricaded himself with the door while students was able to exit out and climb out the window. Right? In other classrooms, he was able to come in just like that one, shoot the teacher, shoot a couple students. And remember what she said as far as him coming back and his shooting was a little bit slower because he was looking for more people to shoot and kill. All right, again, if you think about Miss Patty in the library, she said people under the desk. We talked about two things that determine the number of deaths, target availability, and how quickly the police arrive. So that target availability is very, very, very significant. All right, that's very, very, very significant for you guys. If we don't make ourselves a target, all right, that shooter has, his plan is, is out the door. And that's what we want. We want to be able to survive, we want to fight, we want to win. We want to disrupt his plan with our own plan, which is to survive. All right, so again, we, want to, we don't want to do things like hiding under a table. I want to do the next best sure thing, which is to leave as soon as I possibly can. And we're going to talk about that here really, really soon. All right, so hiding and hope. Hide and, we call this hide and hope. We're, I'm not an advocate for the hide and hope. You guys have heard me talk a little bit about it, so I'm going to finish up about it. The hiding and hoping, the hiding.